I want to start off by asking you, how did you hear about me? Why did you reach out? So putting you Gary, on the spot, Gary Vaynerchuk has a cameraman named D rock. D rock has a Twitter and I found you on Twitter on D rocks, Twitter thread talking about some, uh, he, he tweeted something like, does anyone have a podcast or whatever? Like some people I know want to be on a podcast or need guests for their podcast. And I literally, it, it just clicked in my mind one day I was in bed and I was reading all these tweets, like I have a podcast or I want to guess on people's podcast. And I thought, why haven't I been on more podcasts? And I realized I, I kind of want a new outlet because I entertain a lot. I educate quite a bit online, but I don't really connect with any audience on like a personal level and i've been doing this for years now but i've only ever done i think one podcast and i guess in the back of my mind i just wanted something as an outlet to be an actual person and to describe the background of things that no one that i I just don't normally talk about and you happen to be one of the few people that i saw on the uh, twitter thread at that specific moment on twitter and um yeah i just i messaged i did i did the classic you know contact a bunch of people and a small percentage of them will respond back to you. And I think you are now the second of three people that ended up responding out of the entire group that I messaged. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, short backstory on me, just cause I think it's has a lot to do with how this connection even started in 2017 D rock who I'm not going to say I know well, but I, I know of them very well and been following him for a while. He tweeted something very similar and was like, hey, because I'm from Austin, Texas. And he was like, hey, does anybody need a D-Rock in Austin, Texas? This guy's looking for one. I did the same thing you did and responded. And I got that job and I got to work with a, a very powerful and cool individual for two years. And I nice. owe D-Rock that, you know? And so there's a video I made on YouTube called Thank You D-Rock. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he's, he's a tremendous, low key, underrated, underappreciated treasure on the internet, like he really is. And so uh, I knew that's why you reached out. But I just wanted to to make sure and I think that's really cool. So john, I I got a lot of questions for you. So I'm I'm gonna come in hot. (laughs) Do it. I love it. That's why I'm here. John, john ways. Is that your real name? No. Is that your stage name? Yes. What that's you, something that's going to blow a bunch of people's minds, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, just so you know, Knives Monroe's my name. That's my name. It started off as a pseudonym, and then I legally changed my name to Knives Monroe. Are you 20- serious? Yeah, in 2014. It Dude, started off. Dope. <laughs> thanks. It started off as a pseudonym, and then it just stuck. You know, uh, when, I had a, when I had a daughter, I gave her the last name Monroe, even though that wasn't my real name. Wow. And then I was like, I should probably change it for real. <laughs> and so I did. Um, so I'm all about the pen name and I kind of just got that vibe because there's a, you have a mysterious sort of allure to you and your presentation. So that's why I, I wanted, that's why I wanted to ask. So that makes me wonder what is the, what gave you the um, kind of uh, interpretation of that mysterious lure? Well, that name stuck out to me and I've been booking a lot of guests on my show and either it was a recurring guest or somebody that I know personally, but John Ways, I was like, wait, who, who is this? Who's this person? Is that like a pseudonym? Is that, is that a name that belongs to somebody else? <laughs> then I was like, oh no, it's, it's John from Twitter. Oh, okay, great. So I just had, I just had a, like a sixth sense about that. But you had mentioned in the, in the calendar invite that you wanted to talk about this project that you're working on and you gave me a brief um, kind of synopsis as to what you bring to the table. And I was deeply fascinated by that. So how, how did you get started doing what you're doing today and tell the audience what you're doing today? So 
The backstory is uh, very cliche. When I was, I think it was my eighth Christmas, I got a magic kit. And then I, I just became obsessed with the idea of becoming the world's best magician. Like that, for some reason in my mind, I was like, if I become the world's best magician, most famous, greatest magician, that would be the American dream. Fast forward 10 years, I get my first um, paid gig is like $150 for a kid's party. And I was in high school. And I was like, holy crap, people are paying me three figures to do a kid's party. That's crazy. And a year after that, I went to college and I was invited out to Vegas by Jay Noble Zada, who created one of David Blaine's most popular TV effects, which was the self-tying shoelace, where David Blaine went up to a group of kids, and he literally just shook his foot back and forth, and the laces literally tied themselves. And that was the most popular magic trick that year, because David Blaine featured it. So I always consider and called Jay Noble Zada, David Blaine's consultant. And Jay Noble Zada reached out to me, and was like, hey, we're putting a test group together of about 50 or 60 people in Vegas, would you mind coming out? And he only, back backstory to that is he only reached out to me personally because during Christmas one year, uh, my mom got me, I used to have my mom when I was a teenager get me like magic tricks off a magic website because again, I was thinking about, about becoming a professional magician. And I got this one trick, air quotes, where it was a two hour audio on how to talk to people and subliminally message them to forget things and I was like this is the weirdest trick ever now mind you I read in the description it was like some sort of hypnosis but ironically I thought hypnosis was bullshit and I was like nah whatever we're just gonna go with the magic aspect and then I learned it and I went to one of my old friends and I actually got him to forget both the playing card he was holding as well as his first name and I was like, that's crazy. And I posted it to YouTube and Jay was like, hey, you're one of the first people to get that training and post proof that it worked. Mm. We're trying to put it now, fast forward, we're trying to put a test group together. Would you come out to Vegas? I was like 19, freshman in college. And I was like, okay, uh, Vegas, cool. Yeah, let's go. I mean, I'm 19. I can't go to strip clubs or drink alcohol. So let's learn hypnosis. That seems like the normal thing to do as, as, as a 19 college, uh, 19 year old college student. So I went what out year, there. What year is this? Uh, that was 2011. Okay. And so I went out there. And I was one of the youngest uh, students there, but I was quickly one of the fastest growing ones because I went from being super socially anxious and awkward, and I only hypnotized like one or two people my first day of training, to by the third night of training, and mind you, they put you in a seminar room for like nine hours a day, and they teach you the psychology and the approach and what to say and this and that. I think the third day I hypnotized probably between 12 and 24 people. And mind you, the training is like, they put you in the seminar room. They have you hypnotize each other. So you understand the basics and you have enough confidence to go out and do it in the real world. And then they throw you out on Fremont street where for six hours, basically until about six or 7 AM Eastern standard time, you're out on Fremont street, walking up to strangers. You have to introduce yourself, convince them to, you are a hypnotist and convince them to let you hypnotize them all within a minute and then actually start hypnotizing them within that same minute, minute and a half. And the third night I hypnotized over a dozen people and I came back and I started hypnotizing my college department. Uh, I was in theater and I started hypnotizing a lot of the theater students and then it quickly escalated. I made the school newspaper and then when I started posting videos of it on YouTube again, Jay was like, hey, you're doing really well and you're progressing. Do you want to come to the next training? So on my 20th birthday, months later, I went to the San Diego training and it was a lot of the same material. So I kind of knew it, but there were students there who were never in the Vegas training. So they had some questions about some of the intricacies. And I felt that I knew enough that I could kind of answer those questions and help train them. And so I did. So it was really weird that like four months after my initial trade, excuse me, my initial training, I was already performing semi-professionally without realizing it at that time. And then I was already literally teaching people either my age or literally twice my age. And it was at that seminar that they basically said, hey, you can make this much money. I was like, holy crap, that's way more than I'm making with magic. I'm gonna and how much? College. And how much money did they say? They said the average that we should be starting at was 1200 an hour. And I was like, what? I'm charging. That's insane. I was like, I'm charging 150 for magic, dude. I don't think anyone's gonna pay a 19, 20 year old $1,200. And what blew my mind was, um, I think, my first ever magic gig was 300 and then the one after that was 300 and um it, it it honestly didn't take me long though 
until I charged my first $1,200 show. And I think that was on my birthday a year or two later, just because at that time I wasn't comfortable doing it. And I didn't understand the psychology behind kind of pitching yourself. And I had no idea. Like I said earlier, yeah. I was like, wow, I can make so much money. I'm going to quit college. And at the time, my mom was living in New York. I'm like, mom, I'm going to quit college. And she's like, don't. So I did. What and were you going to college for? So initially, I went for computer science because yeah. <laughs> I really liked coding in HTML in high school. And then my counselor was like, hey, your SAT math scores, they suck. And I was like, cool. Uh, can I become an actor? Because my stepbrother lives in Japan. He does acting and teaching. And I was like, I'll become an actor. And um, through acting and the acting classes in college, I realized that I like being on stage. I just quickly realized I didn't like being told what to do on stage. I want to do my own thing. And then I realized, well, I could do stage magic. And then obviously that eventually turned into, well, we can do stage hypnosis and that makes a lot of money. And it's cool because unlike magic, and that's why, why one reason that I fell in love with hypnosis is unlike magic, we got to carry around deck of cards or props or have things up your sleeves. You can literally do magic anytime, anywhere with anyone completely naked. Like you don't need anything special. It's just psychology and science and that's what blew me away is there's no trick and people are like well what's the trick there's no trick it's magic <laughs> the religious extremists say that yeah <laughs> well i, I want to i'm okay so i'm gonna we're gonna go deep and i am so fascinated by this this is so cool i have a lot of questions out the gate and thank you for setting up your story in a way it sounds like you were kind of made for this how many people get to go into magic and then when they're 19, I mean, they obviously saw something in you. You were a natural. Would you agree with that? Uh, in retrospect, yeah. Initially. It didn't feel that way. It felt, it's weird because like in a sense, like it was a natural transition for me in retrospect. But at the time it was just, I honestly still believe that I was going to become a professional magician and love that more. And that hypnosis was going to become the side thing and ironically has been completely switched but one of my colleagues in Michigan who uh, let me perform a show with him for some sort of camp retreat years ago in Michigan even he said he's like dude he's like I'm an artist and I like doing hypnosis but hypnosis is my side thing he goes you were made for it and I was like you know yeah like and I told one of my childhood best friends I was like if someone came up to me right now and offered me a guaranteed six-figure income every single year, but I wasn't allowed to do what I do now, I told him I wouldn't take it because it was in that moment I realized you literally cannot buy happiness. And I realized on and off consistently every year, if I'm not performing in some capacity, whether it's for fun or obviously eventually to pay bills as well, because it does, I'm not happy. And that's, I think, kind of what resonated for me. Like, yeah. That's a smart like thing. what I'm that's meant to do. You, you learned that at a, at a good time too. Um, some people, like our parents' generation, happiness wasn't even really on the table, man. Like, I, I, maybe I'm speaking just for my mom, but you know, she, did, she went to school and she got a job. She was a single parent and she did what she had to do because she had bills, period. You know, I, I, I've recontextualized my childhood and I've told her how grateful I am that she sacrificed having a dream so I could have a dream. Like I had the privilege and the luxury to choose my profession. That's mm -hmm. still like a new concept in this 21st century. So the fact that you were able to think, you know, that you, you're so lucky that you can decide I'm going to choose happiness over money. Don't get me wrong though. Cause earlier when I said, you know, I'm going to quit school. My mom said, don't, I always joke, especially right before my high school or college shows. Cause those are younger audiences with very malleable minds. I always say, you know, people say, oh, well, I have a dream, but my parents don't approve of it. I'm like, well, when I realized I wanted to do hypnosis, I'm like, hey, mom, I'm going to quit school. And she's like, don't. So I did. That's a joke, but it's a joke. And my mom recently has said, that's not quite how it works. So now I always say after the joke, I go, but my mom would like to, you to know, that's a summary of a six-year phone conversation. Mm -hmm. At first, my mom, and I'm not even joking, said for years over the phone, and I quote, go flip a fucking burger. Because she it. wanted to have a more stable consistent paycheck and i in retrospect like i get it but i also I, I lived through the 2008 crash i watched what it did to my family I, I watched what it did to other families who were wealthy or who had stable consistent paychecks and i'm like mm, not sure about that 
understood, but it still take it still takes guts to disappoint your parents. And to say and to wear the, you know, the animosity, the friction, the the conflict, the tension, like to wear that, most people just want to please their parents. And I completely yeah. I completely understand why, you know. Um I want to go back and and ask you a very basic question like how did you even get into magic we'll put a pin in that but just, just to kind of tie up this end here yeah where is your mom at now with what you do now that you're bringing in some i i, I would <laughs> i would hope some consistent revenue yeah no uh it's funny because i think it was about a year or two ago was the first time and, and i want to re-emphasize what i just said a year or two ago was the first time i'm pushing 30 now i started when i was 19 and a year or two ago was the first time during Christmas where my mom said that she was proud of me and what I've done and the fact that I decided to stay coarse despite what her and a lot of people in my life said. Because when people don't live the life you live or see the vision you see or are not in the field that you're in, they can't really fully understand. Um, but she said that she was proud and she's gone from go flip the fucking burger and do you have a job? Do you have a consistent paycheck? To literally her primary question every time she sees me is so how's business or when's your next show? Like that's her automatic response now. It takes a long time. That's the other, that's the other thing, man. I see a lot of kids who a don't want to disappoint their parents. And I understand that, but it's like, you're going to resent them for not living your dream. Just so you know, I say sacrifice it in the moment and at least go fail. And it's okay. If they're right, fine. You guys will be tighter, but you know, go risk it, man. Like, you don't have forever. Like I'm very reticent of someday. Like I don't believe in someday, not because I'm such a goal oriented, ambitious person. It's just, I can't take someday for granted. Like I, all I have is today. Um, anytime I book something in advance, do you hear this lightning and thunder? It's insane. Um, anytime I book something in advance, I'm always anxious that, well, what if something falls through? And by that, Worst case scenario, I mean, what if somebody dies? What if somebody passes away? What if there's what if a pandemic die? that cancels South by Southwest? I mean, you never know, right? What if um, we die? What if we die? And it's like, like you and I could die before this interview ends. And posts. I know that people think that, you know, that's a very pessimistic way of looking at things, but I don't look at it pessimistically. I look at it realistically, which is why I love, for example, David Blaine. And you asked earlier what got me into magic. I got my parents technically got me in magic with the magic kit, but growing up and as a teenager watching David Blaine and even recently his ascension and stunt, he's the first human in history to ascend only to 25,000 feet. And people are like, oh, wasn't that impressive? It wasn't magic. Trick. I'm thinking, you go up there, motherfucker. No one's going to have the guts to do that. I've been skydiving once and it gave me extreme vertigo and anxiety. And I had an anxiety seizure after I got to the ground. But seeing that made me want to do it again. And I'm thinking he didn't die, but he's living more than anyone viewing it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I kind of do what I do. And the ADHD kind of helps with that. Cause I'm, I'm always motivated to go and do more. And it, the parent approval is for me personally, I think I was just so sold and understanding of my own vision. And I already knew it could work mm -hmm. that no one's naysay had any effect on me. And I know that a lot of people are kind of held down by the whole, you know, my parent wants this, my parent wants that. And I'm just like, what was your proof of concept as a kid that, oh yeah, I could do this. People doing it. That was good enough. Even though like, did you know anybody in person that had succeeded and you were like, oh, well, if uncle Joe can do it, I can do it. Or just people on TV. No, my trainers were literally doing it professionally and charging a stupid amount of money. And I thought before well, you had the trainers, you had the dream though. No. Oh, well for the magic thing, I, I think it was just, you know, a kid thing. It's like you, you get something happens to you when you're a kid or something resonates to you, with you when you're a kid. So as a kid growing up, I was like, Oh, magic. Like I just thought it was cool. And then when I saw people like David Copperfield, finally, I was like, Oh, people do big productions, which means they make a lot of money, which means this can't help. So, when it came to magic, it was primarily the internet and specifically David Blaine with the TV thing. I'm like, oh, he's successful. He's doing well. Yeah. Um, and eventually, obviously, David Blaine's connection with Jay inviting me to Vegas kind of led me to realize, oh, like I am now kind of in a some way, shape or form connected to these bigger mm -hmm. figures through these yeah. smaller figures and they're doing it. So 
there's no reason I can't if I'm fully in. Okay. So I want to share with you a story. Um, and you might know, you're like the only person on the planet I've ever told this to. And I think we'll get it. In 2005 or six, there's this carnival that came to town. And I was with a girlfriend, maybe we were together for like a year or two. Oh, funny anecdote. Her dad is a magician. Her dad is a magician. And so she kind of grew up behind the scenes. And he was like the great and powerful, whatever his name was. And um, one day we go to this carnival and there's a magician who's entertaining 50 people or so. And he asks for volunteers. He's going to hypnotize them. And to kind of just troll my girlfriend, I thought I'll volunteer. And it was really just to embarrass her, just raising my hand. But the guy picked me. So he brings me on stage and I can't remember really what we did, but he was like, he created this balloon animal um, out of like, it was, oh, I mean, he created a, a balloon guitar and he gave it to me and he was like, he's going to play it. And then I played it. I cut a solo on this little guitar thing. And I remember making eye contact on stage with my girlfriend who was looking at me like, you motherfucker, what are you doing? What are you doing? But I, I played the part that I was being hypnotized. I can say I was never hypnotized. I mean, I wasn't. But I, I knew, I understood the performance aspect of like going along. I understood that. I have, we talked about this off mic, you know, or maybe we talked about it on mic, actually. Um, my name change, the name originally came from, uh, I created, I, I was trained as a backyard, as a wrestler. Oh, wow. like, like the kind that you've seen, like The Rock or John Cena or something. And so early, I was doing pro wrestling, not because I wanted to be a wrestler, but because I liked filming it. I'm a filmmaker. It's what I do. So I liked filming the behind the scenes. And wrestling's fake. Like you tell, you whisper the moves to each other when you, it's a performance art, right? Mm -hmm. Not unlike magic. You tuck in the scenes and it's the, what do they say? The, the disbelief, right? The suspension of disbelief. And so I took my wrestling background and when this hypnosis brought me on stage, I knew I was going to play with them. I didn't want to make them look bad and be like, this isn't affecting me, bro. What is this? You know, I wasn't going to be like that. But when I went off stage, my girlfriend was like, did he really hypnotize you? What the fuck? And I was like, no, we we're just having fun. And he was just like, were you in on this? And I was like, no, he just picked me. I, like, I couldn't have planned that, but I understood because she, she grew up as a magician's daughter. Like she knew, like, did you put in some pre-production around that? And I did. <laughs> um, so that my is my only, totally. <laughs> that is my only, um, that's my only experience with hypnosis. So can you walk me through like your hypnosis story? Like, was it ever performed on you? Did it work? Did you understand, did you, did, did you understand the, the science behind how it worked? And are you comfortable with talking about how it works or yeah. is that a secret? No, that's also what I always find kind of humorous for people. Like, can you tell me a secret? Like, like I said before, it's not magic. There is no secret. It's literally just psychology and science. It's actually taught in psychology, uh, sometimes high school, but a lot of times um, university psychology classes. What, what is the definition of hypnosis? So the definition, I think through Webster, it's like uh, an altered state of trance, uh, like a trance-like state of consciousness where you're more um, open and susceptible to suggestion. And after almost a decade of studying and practicing hypnosis, my issue with that is the fact that it's a very generalized definition in the sense of actual hypnosis in and of itself is different than stage hypnosis. So hypnosis in and of itself can be watered down to one word, relaxation, which means literally we all experience hypnosis every single day. If you're ever relaxing or you're spacing out, that's hypnosis. If you're in a business meeting and you space out and you're kind of daydreaming, you're in alpha state. That's hypnosis. If you're driving and you miss your stop or something because, or you get to your stop, but you don't remember the, everything that happened the way there, that's because you were somewhere else. And again, in alpha state, that's also called highway hypnosis. So we all experience it every day. It's just society doesn't call it hypnosis. So we relate it to the Hollywood over dramatized scenes that we see but actual hypnosis is just mental physical relaxation as where hypnotic phenomena which is stage hypnosis is where you're so mentally and physically relaxed that your inhibitions are lowered 
you care less about what other people think. And therefore it's kind of like alcohol where you're willing to do and say what you wouldn't normally do or say in your regular state of being. And it's the phenomenon of giving into your imagination and allowing whatever commands the hypnotist gives you to become your temporary ultimate reality in that moment. If that makes sense. That makes total sense. So what, what, what have you done hypnosis online? I think you mentioned that you did. Yeah. When the pandemic first started, me and my student, actually, my first ever hypnosis student from years ago, Hypnotic D, held our first um, virtual hypnosis show, which actually ended up going really well. And we actually had a skeptic on there. He's like, you know, I want to come because, you know, you guys seem pretty cool. I like Hypnotic D. I heard, you know, you trained him and I want to have some fun. And obviously the pandemic is getting to all of us. We have cabin fever. Yeah. And he said, you know, I tried to get hypnotized at a party one time, but it was a lot of noise and commotion. Didn't really work. And within about five minutes, we had him under. And I got him to the point where he didn't even remember his name. He didn't remember where he lived. And then at the very end, we actually hypnotized him to believe that he was the hypnotist and that we stole his show and to get really pissed at us, which he did. And then at the very end, we kind of wiped it and we're like, hey, you remember everything. You're not mad anymore. You actually feel better than you did before we started. And he went on, he had like some sort of like virtual show of his own to do on another app after that, which I watched. And um, after the show, he actually goes on the app. He's like, I was just hypnotized and this is crazy. And uh, it worked. And, you know, these guys are amazing. Check them out, whatever. So um, yeah, we've done multiple virtual shows since the beginning of the pandemic. Although our, my first physical show back in the market was back in, I think, middle of June for a uh, wedding ceremony in Wisconsin, which was really fun because that was the first show I ever did at a mansion. And I walked in, I was like, this is really nice. I don't belong here. Yeah, I've been there. If, <laughs> if somebody does not want to be hypnotized, is it safe to say they cannot be hypnotized? So there has to be like a form of consent, I'd imagine. So it, this is kind of... Um, a gray area in the sense that I generally say that is correct for and when I say that though it's, it's generally referring to comedy street or stage hypnosis because as per my other company hypno kick inc we teach online hypnosis and one of the one of the lessons or trainings will be coming out within the future is called covert hypnosis which is a form of hypnosis that people are not consciously aware of like stage hypnosis you're aware of that because you're volunteering it's a voluntary comedy show then there's things like covert hypnosis, which is obviously covert. You're not consciously aware because it's a covert action. It's a covert uh, routine or demonstration or action happening. And I've done covert hypnosis before, <clears throat> whether it's with trying to convince hiring managers when I was growing up and I hadn't made it my career yet to hire me as a part-time job or the like. You can hypnotize people subconsciously through covert hypnosis without them being consciously aware. However, what you're using it for obviously dictates whether or not you're kind of a bad hypnotist or a good hypnotist. But generally speaking, when it comes to regular like comedy hypnosis, which is what most people are kind of um, related to, which is comedy street, comedy stage hypnosis, or obviously hypnotherapy, then uh, yeah, without consent or without wanting to be hypnotized, you're not gonna be. It's not like a spell I can just snap my fingers and it works. If it did, I'd have a girlfriend. <laughs> I bet that works all the time. Uh, you're going to still be using that joke when you have a girlfriend. Um, I do. <laughs> you see? Because you see? Uh, it's so delightful. Um, so say I'm a skeptic. Well, let me rephrase that. Um, have you encountered some sort of moral, ethical, quandary, dilemma, tension online with, with uh you know, we're very, if you look at Twitter culture, it's very, huh? oh you know God. exactly what I'm talking about. I was it, just on Twitter before I got on here. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very, you know, I, I don't know much about the hypnosis scene, but I'd imagine it's problematic. It's just misunderstood. Here, here, here's what the, my inner child is telling me to say. Mm -hmm. I just can't find the, the most mature way to put this, you know, why don't we, if it was real hypnosis, surely it would be illegal. If it was real, why haven't we hypnotized our president to be a better public speaker, a more gentler, kinder, compassionate soul? Um, if it was real um, and you use this sort of unconscious, suggestive, 
covert state to get a job, surely these legal employers would have the right to sue you or something. Like I, it just doesn't seem, it seems like so. How do you think commercials are made? How do you think commercials are made? Right. I understand the idea of programmatic. um, Or let me ask you, Obama messed up his inaugural speech. Okay. When he got inducted to presidency, he actually messed up on live TV. He stuttered multiple times. What do you think made him so good between that first term and the second term? He became a master speaker by the second term. I would say repetition. Who do you think trained him though? I didn't even know. I didn't even know he was trained. If you look at his first speech and when he was first initiated as president compared to his second term, I mean, yeah, repetition can come, but people of power, people of certain 30 get training and there's a lot of, and I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase, there's a lot of NLP. Neuro-linguistic programming. Yeah. There's a lot of NLP practices in his second term Mm -hmm. compared to his first term. Mm -hmm. He does this a lot when he's making a point change there's a lot of synchronicity between hand gestures body movement and phrasing so on that note donald trump is hypnotizing the nation as well but just having adverse maybe consequences or effects i haven't personally studied studied donald trump uh, as much as i did obama because just because he had a drastic change sure uh, trump doesn't seem to have much of a change but he is uh, able to brainwash and i'm getting kind of judgy here but he's mm-hmm. able to i don't want to say brainwash right let's water that down even though i believe that but he's able to awaken something dormant inside a, a majority of america and they start repeating what he says the way he says it, you know, like he's Just the getting, way they did with Obama. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. But I think he's, I don't, I don't know if Obama wore his hate on his sleeve the way this president does. And I didn't vote for Obama and I didn't vote for Donald Trump. So I don't have right. a dog in that fight, but you know, they're both these people. Okay. So an, an, another example, um, you know, mutual friend between us, uh, we know a guy that knows a guy. Gary V um, is a great public speaker. He strikes me as a guy that has put in the reps, mm-hmm. does it for a living and so on. Do you think he's gotten that training? Do you see these kind of quirks? Like professional wrestling, when I watch it now as an adult, I can see when, when a wrestler is telling the ref, like, dude, this guy's hurt. We got to end this soon. Like, I can kind of see the strings. Surely in, in public speaking, you could, you could decipher those cues, no? Um, it's, it's interesting because you asked earlier if um, I, I think that I was made for hypnosis and it just seems natural. A lot of it has been natural for me in, in sense of, um, you know, performing and everything. There are certain aspects, obviously, I got trained in and improved and have honed throughout the past decade. I think that some people have the just natural innate ability to kind of um, know or be able to do or say certain things and I think that uh, that comes with a variety of you know life experience or you know this or that I don't know personally if Gary V has been trained I know that I was actually in contact with his team years ago and I want to help um, provide his sports team with some like um, successful mental conditioning for hypnotherapy or through hypnotherapy to kind of become more successful and whatnot in the actual sports what they do as sports players um and it didn't unfortunately go through because i think they looked at my linkedin they're like and you know how gary used to preach about linkedin and keep it up and i did not keep up on linkedin because i just didn't care Mm -hmm. um but i think that i don't know i can't personally say because i have again i haven't studied i don't know if he has any training but i can say that he is highly respected from what I've seen because he's got a very uh, no bullshit approach with things combined with a lot of empathy and genuine caring for people and masses. And I like it because he, he'll, he'll spit the truth and he'll be like, don't listen to anything positive or negative. He'll be appreciative of the, you know, positive. But then when it comes to people like he'll, he's like, if someone hates me, I want to know why, and I want to see what I can do to improve them, which is something interesting because especially on Twitter, as we both know, Twitter, especially cancel culture right now is huge. Everyone's canceling everyone for every reason. And he's just like, Hey, do you hate me? Why? What's up? Can I, can I, how can I help you? And he'll like 
do whatever and he'll switch people around and convert them in like a tweet or something, which I think is much more, um, in my mind, beneficial and positive than how a lot of people would react to that kind of stuff. So long answer short, I don't know if he's been trained. I think, a, I think quite a bit of it is natural and has come through experience, but he, he might know some stuff and I wouldn't be surprised if he does. So g- great answer. Um, I'm curious, you know, I always hear a lot of inspirational content because you know, there, I forgot who said this, um, some life coach, the godfather of life coach, whatever his name was, he had said that you are like the five people you surround yourself with, right? Oh, Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn. And I think that's true. I got two kids, two dogs, a mother-in-law, and my wife, and those are usually the people I hang around with. So I'm a goofy, I'm a goofy dumbass. But when I'm exercising and I'm getting outside of myself or, you know, I'm a road warrior when I go drive to a gig or whatever, I'm always listening to guys like Gary Vee, Tony Robbins, Jim Rohn, things like this. And that's where I learned about NLP was from Tony Robbins. I'm a big Tony Robbins guy. Mm -hmm. And because I need to surround myself with that positivity. And we always ask people like, how do they do it? You know, um, why are you successful? Give me the answers. Uh, What camera do you use and stuff like that? But, and I'm, you know, that's all fine and dandy. I think we all know how to get a six pack, right? We all know what we got to do the actual grunt work to get those results. But I'm very curious about your mistakes, uh, quite frankly, or regrets or, or some painful lessons. Cause you, you reference these past, what is it? Nine, 11 years. Uh, I'm going on, I think 10, this upcoming spring. Congratulations. Congratulations. 10 years of dedicating yourself to this craft and to this work. Surely there's been, learning lessons. And I, and I want to know about that. Can you give me an example of a time that you bombed to use a, a, a phrase from like comic culture? You know, like uh, what I want to talk about moments where you went from zero to a hundred, where you gained a level and you're like, well, now I know not to do that again. Like, can you paint that picture for me? So one of the first times I feel that I personally severely bombed was um, a misunderstanding. It was during a show for a fraternity slash sorority in Illinois years ago. And I did the show and it was, it was okay. Um, the, the issue came at the very end when I was hypnotizing the one, one of the last guys on stage and I was hypnotizing him to experience the phenomenon of being frozen. Like he couldn't move his arms, his feet. I basically quote unquote paralyzed him with the relaxation so it just felt more relaxing for him not to do anything than to try to move. So it gave the illusion that he was frozen. And at one point I was like, can you do anything? Can you like put your hand up like the Statue of Liberty? Can you do the Hail Hitler? Can you do this? Can you do that? And within about a minute or two, people in the back of the room started stirring. And then they started leaving. And then they started getting really loud in another room. And then they came back and got even louder. And I was like, they're getting really disruptive. And one older lady in the front row looked at me and said, you need to take him out. And I was like, it's okay. I know what I'm doing. You know, he's not experiencing any app reactions or negative reactions with hypnosis. And I'm going to take him out because the show's coming to a close. And she looked at me and goes, no, you need to take him out now. I go, is there something he needs to attend to or something? And she goes, yeah, you need to take him out now. So I took him out. Um, and no one was really clapping or applauding or cheering. I was like, what's going on? And then, the organizer came up to me and said, what the hell are you doing? You just made a Hitler conference and this, or a Hitler reference, and this is a Jewish fraternity. Mm. I had no clue. Yeah. And she later framed it and said, you know, making a Hitler joke is not okay. And then I'm not even joking. This is the first show I've ever had where people were literally making a line to come up to me and insult me one by one. Even the parents who you'd think would be more mature First of all, it wasn't a joke. It was a reference. So he understood what I wanted him to do to prove that he couldn't do it, but they misinterpreted it as a joke. Sure. But I was so overwhelmed with the fact that they were so filled with instantaneous rage and anger and negativity that I just wanted to leave because it was too much for me to handle emotionally, like all of it coming at once. And literally I'm packing up and people are coming up one at one, one on one cursing at me uh, you know, insulting me. And even the parents were literally coming up and cursing and insulting my parents. And one woman said, you know, your mother should be ashamed to be with someone like you, or, you know, how dare your mother birth someone like you? And I was like, 
what the hell? You, this has nothing to do with my mother. In retrospect, I think that's crazy and silly to say something like that. But that was the first time I ever walked away from a show crying. Um, and I didn't cry until after I left the show. But I think that made me realize that one, you have to do your research and you have to question the client and the venue and everything about it before going in. And But sometimes you don't think about certain aspects and details about that like that until you experience it. But I think that that's a great opportunity as well because the positive thing that came from that is I now know, hey, I'll ask a client or a venue, what are touchy subjects? What is the, what is the mm -hmm. background of yeah. the people that are going to be doing? What is, what is and isn't okay to mention and or joke about? And what kind of rating do you want the company to be? G, P, G, 13, yeah. R. That's, that's the first thing we talked about before we got on the podcast. You know, because you never know, you never know. For some people, they're a military vet and they don't want to talk about what they did overseas. Not today. They don't want to talk about it. Even if that's the reason why, you know, people know them, they don't want to talk about it. And so I give people that, that option just because if I get into that position where I said something I shouldn't have said, you know, you should have told me, you should have told me, you had an opportunity to tell me, you know, um, I wonder if you, if they would have been okay with you making that reference if you were jewish yourself you know what i mean isn't that interesting i how, think about that all the time how, how did they know you weren't jewish you yeah. know that's just interesting immediately the the comedic part of me wants to say because i have a small nose <laughs> but sure. you know you can only go so far with certain jokes because some people don't understand that uh comedy is a um, subjective satire right and it you know it's about um it's about confront confrontation and con uh, confronting tension and commenting on like conflict and, and all those things and poking fun at that. So I, I, I get what you're, I get what you're saying. It's a very that's a, hard that's thing. A, that's a great example of a time, you know, I have stories like that myself and in, in my own, in my own genre. Um, so I want to, I want to get back to hypnosis. Um, has anybody ever asked you, Hey, I'm afraid of snakes or something like that. Can you help me not be afraid of snakes? Like, have, are you able to, with your skills in hip and hypnosis, are you able to, I feel like the word cure sends like a red flag in your industry, I'd imagine, but are you able to, to remedy some people using therapy like this or, hip, or hypnosis? It's funny that you said snakes. Cause right when you said snakes, what popped in my mind was every person that's ever asked me to help them quit smoking is the most requested form that I get of hypnotherapy, by the way. Yeah, that would fall into any, any time I tell people that you're asking for hypnosis for help with anything, it's always correlated to hypnotherapy, which I'm certified to do. But I stepped away from it years ago. Um, I still do it now and then, depending on the, the client and what they want. But I primarily specialize in stress and anxiety management because that's what I grew up with. And that's why I know best. And I will sometimes outsource certain clients to other hypnotherapists that I know do better with smoking and such. Because when I did smoking cessation sessions years ago, um, I realized one of two things was always happening. Either one, the client always thought I had a magic word or phrase I could use to just snap them out of it and make them want to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. um, and two, they often weren't coming because they really wanted a better life is because like a loved one or a wife or a child wanted them to do it, but they may not have been completely emotionally sold on it themselves. And mm -hmm. one thing I've learned is if you're not emotionally fully invested and dedicated to a certain outcome, it's going to fail. It's like a diet. People are just like, Oh, today I'm motivated because I saw like a video. And so today I'm going to eat right. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do this or that. But if you're not fully emotionally dedicated to the end result, like I was with becoming a performer, then the next day you wake up, you're like, I feel like crap. Let's go for the jelly dunk for breakfast. And then you wonder why in a week or a month that you haven't made any progress is because you don't have that thing. So smokers often came to me and I just got a sense. And it's something that isn't always even verbal. It's kind of like you said earlier with my name. Sometimes you can just sense it. And a lot of times I just sense that they were looking for that magic word or phrase or remedy or pill. And I would tell them, hey, you, th that's not how this works. If it did, I would charge you way more, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, and so the answer is I have and I do, but I do much less just because also the other thing was I started getting a lot of clients who were heavily medicated because 
I have a um, doctor north of here who lives and helps a lot of wealthier people. And those people, because they're going through him, usually pretty medicated. And so when I was initially working out of an office years ago, they came to me and they always kind of looked like they had their soul stolen from their eyes. And it was always kind of draining to me. And that's when I realized, oh, not only is energy real, but every time I'm doing a session with these like soulless looking people who I did help and I, I felt good that I helped, but I always felt drained afterward. And I always felt way happier and more energetic and more energized versus drained after a show. And then that's kind of what made me realize like, I need to heavily focus on the entertainment aspect. I can still help people with the entertainment aspect. And I'm currently tweaking a brand new hypnosis show tour that actually helps me um, help a group of people achieve their individual goals by the end of the show and overcome, you know, fears or mental blocks after an hour of having fun and letting loose. Um, so it kind of helps me energize myself, let people let go of their stress, entertain them and help them all within about an hour, an hour and a half of one comedy show without having to drain myself. That's beautiful. Uh, describe to me your, your ideal client. Like what is it, if you met a human and you're like, this guy is so malleable, he's got positive energy, he's open-minded, you know, but he has this affliction. All he needs is like a little tug here and there or whatever. Like what is uh, the type of client that you'd look for that you feel you can provide a lot of value for and, and it replenishes your cup as well? Uh, just, I, I'd probably say adult parties in the sense of, young adult or sometimes older adult, but older, the older generations tend to be kind of iffy with comedy hypnosis, but um, sometimes you get lucky and they're not, but I would say comedy hypnosis shows where they just want to have fun. Like, you know, we're going to be drinking or whatever. Um, we just want to have some fun. We want something different and unique. We've never done this before. Maybe we have, but we want something, someone new and there is no limits. You can do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. We just want to, um, we just want to have fun because the, the clients who basically give me free reign to do whatever I want, I never do it. I've never done anything crazy. I've, I've contemplated like an X-ray hypnosis show because I know those exist, mm -hmm. um, but I've never done it. Um, but I think the clients who are just super mellow and easygoing and they don't bring any children. So I don't have to worry about like my language or anything because I, I realized years ago after I did um, a Jewish party for kids that, I was kind of done with kid parties. And I told my manager, I was like, unless we're charging like this much, like it's just, I don't feel fulfilled versus with adults. Cause I'm an adult now. And I feel like doing more adult related humor, even if it's insinuative or innuendos and just experimenting. I think that's one of my favorite things is like doing the classics, which is like, for example, forget your name or your butts glued to the chair or something like that. And mixing that in with either new material I have or experimental stuff that literally comes to the top of my head in the middle of performing that I've never done before. So having the freedom to do that with a client who is open and willing to just have fun and, and let me experiment and experience those things with me is probably my favorite thing. Man. Uh, so what does your bucket list look like? Like you mentioned David Blaine and his Ascension that was on the, at the top of his list for a long time, that, that image, right? Um, mm -hmm. What is stuff that you want to do or people you want to work with or the impact that you want to make using hypnosis? So ironically, that actually kind of goes in with the project we're doing because um, I have a bigger plan, but we're not publicly stating that plan yet because legally we don't know one it's just not a smart idea to do legally. Uh, but two, we haven't gotten approved yet. And we're in the process of trying to get approved for this one thing. So I'm already in the process of doing one of my biggest bucket, lo bucket list things. Um, and it all starts with the episode that we just premiered last Friday. Well, tell me more about that. So we went out uh, two months ago when COVID was huge and everyone was scared of everything. Um, my team and I flew out to... LA and we met one of my friends in Santa Monica or in um, I think North or South Hollywood. And then we drove, he drove us to Santa Monica to meet one of my friends who's now a huge uh, TikToker, only JS. And we created an episode, which I had been brainstorming for years. The initial idea I had was I wanted to make it look like a girl drives up in a nice car and I can walk up to her and hypnotize her to give her to give me her keys 
without her stopping me. And then I could hijack her car and just drive off while she's still under hypnosis. And just to get a hidden camera footage of people like reacting, like, would they stop me? How would they react? Would they try to help her? What would happen? What would be the social dynamic? And so uh, I remember we did like an Instagram video call with this guy and her. And I was like, here's my idea. Here's a project we want to do. Are you in? And she agreed. So two months ago, we went out and we flew out. We scouted locations. We came up with the idea. And then we filmed a whole episode on the myths about hypnosis. So it was about educational entertainment. It was, hey, we, we've hypnotized you. Like I hypnotized her for years since she was 18. Now she's like 21, I think, and 21, 22. And I was like, so now that you've been hypnotized by me and a bunch of other hypnotists, I want to teach you how to hypnotize people. And we're going to start with by teaching you the myths. And what we did is we interviewed her on the couch. And we're like, hey, what are your ideas about hypnosis? And by the way, these are the myths that people are going to associate you with if you're going to become a hypnotist. And we take each myth and then we take it out into the real world and we actually demonstrate said myth in the real world to see how people react. And the whole idea is it's a huge comedy showing how ridiculous people, people's perception of hypnosis is. Like one of them mm -hmm. is like, oh, you can snap a fingers and snap your fingers and get someone to reveal their deepest, darkest secrets. So my cameraman literally follows me on the streets of Santa Monica. I'm like, hey, if a hypnotist snaps his fingers, do you think that you can reveal your deepest, darkest secrets? And one guy goes, yeah, I go, what's your secrets? And he just starts laughing. I go, so it doesn't work, okay. And we created a whole episode um, around that and we did the premiere and everyone, uh, everyone was just like laughing hysterically. And one woman even said, um, my ex thought that hypnosis was demonic possession. And so we actually went out and we staged a hypnosis demonic possession um, in the middle of a mini crowd and people stopped and the hidden camera showed people stopping and looking like, what the hell is going on? And some, what, our actor friend, Andrew, was like pretending to be possessed. And then I run and people are like, oh my God, are they okay? And then people look at each other. They're like, mm -hmm. well, that's weird. Let's go about our day. <laughs> it's like, not how it works. Right. Let me ask you, um, is there anything that you've learned? And maybe this is a myth when it comes to hypnosis that, that is anything supernatural is later defined by science, right? Um, but have you found anything that science has yet to explain when it comes to hypnosis? I mean, we know so little, when I say we, I'm lumping myself in with all these scientists and neurologists, but, you know, accumulatively, like we know so little about the brain, you know, we know more about like what's underneath the ocean than we do our own brains and, and how they work per se. Have you encountered anything in your experience that you would, that you would call inexplicable or or unfathomable or something that you can't articulate or understand? Uh, not really, because- Like, have you ever been to a, a hardcore church where people be speaking in tongues and whatnot, <laughs> and you have pastors like knocking people down? Like, let's be, <laughs> let's be real, that this is a form of hypnosis. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a form of like mass hypnosis uh, for, um, you know, obviously the financial gain of the priest or, whatever a lot of those churches are uh, literally just hype based and the psychology behind that is just a lot of hype and people buy into this placebo that if they pay this amount of money or they go to these people they're going to be cured and because of the adrenaline they feel cured if they have like an ailment like arthritis or something but then like days afterward they're like hey it came back it didn't work and then they end up complaining their reports on that but um i've never been to a church where people randomly start um speaking in tongues i was actually just on twitter before this and Philip DeFranco, who I watched the news show of daily on YouTube, actually made a tweet about a day ago saying, you know, if you're part of religion or you were, but you're no longer, explain why. And I was explaining when I was doing magic as a kid, I was being told that, oh, that's a gift from God. And ironically, my name means gift from God. I go, but the moment I decided to do comedy stage hypnosis or street comedy street hypnosis, all of a sudden people went, people in the religious community, especially religious religious extremists went from you have to gift from god to you're doing the devil's work and i was like do you understand the psychology and science behind what i do and none of them did and there was a point where a nun said you know you need to let god have control and i was like doesn't your god give you free will he doesn't control you and she didn't know how to respond to that so she sent me to another nun who's like that's devil worship i'm like really because in the catholic catechism it says the church recognizes it as a good thing for therapy she didn't know how to respond to that. So she sent me to the eldest nun and the eldest nun was like, you just need to go away. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but other than getting judged by the very religious, um, I mean, as far as the science and psychology goes, a lot of people don't know, like Stanford University already did an MRI study years ago, proving and showing through an MRI, the physiological and scientific changes that occurred to the brain when under hypnosis and science is coming out every so many months with different studies and new reports of the legitimacy of hypnosis. And um, so, I mean, I've been looking into and studying that a lot because I realize most people aren't. Do you and meditate? Not as much as I want to, honestly. Do you perform hypnosis on yourself? Yeah, self-hypnosis, yeah. And what, benef uh, what benefit do you get out of it? Like, how do you better yourself? Stress relief, um, anxiety control. Um, I'm definitely less angry than I used to be. Like when I was a teenager, I was so angry. I had so much angst, but you know, who didn't as a teenager? Um, but I, I would definitely say it's helped me get things in perspective, be less angry less quickly. And it helps control things because a lot of people don't realize that your mind literally, as Bruce Lee would say, your mind controls your body especially if you train it really well, you know how to. And one of my most famous forms of hypnotherapy is hypnotic stress control, where there's a certain gesture I teach people to use to control their mental, physical, and emotional stress and anxiety in the moment. Even if you're busy doing something, you can do this one thing. And if you've been practicing and doing the hypnotherapy on a regular basis, then you could literally just do it in seconds. You could feel the same relaxation you feel after like an hour of hypnotherapy. Um, and that's something that I don't use regularly anymore just because I know it and I can kind of think about it and self-induce it myself without a full-on session. But I think that's been really powerful because, and I, if you don't mind me going on a really quick side rant about that, please, um, using the trigger to help control the stress and anxiety is similar to kind of um, replacing drugs, if you will, because, and this was an interesting conversation I had with a Lyft driver about a year ago. I'm not sure if this is true, but it makes complete sense. And I haven't studied the science behind it. So don't quote me on this. But he mentioned to me he, that he used to do a lot of drugs in college and when he grew up. And he said, do you know why people get addicted to drugs? I was like, because I take them a lot. And he goes, because your brain already produces all the natural chemicals that drugs that you put in your body, the, the effects that those drugs have on you, your brain already produces all those chemicals. You just don't consciously know how to tap into it and release those within your body so the more often you take them let's say you take it every day for two weeks the more often more um you know consciously you choose to take that external source the less your mind is going to produce it internally and it's going to eventually cut cut that off and so for example coke heads you know do enough coke for enough period of time consistently your brain stops producing the natural chemicals that Coke gives you when you take it externally. So internally, your brain shuts that off. And now that you're no longer getting that internally, your brain goes, well, we're not getting that internally because you've been taking it externally for so long. So you need to go get more right now because we need this right now. And that's where the addiction comes from. That's what I've learned though. Uh, I haven't studied it, but it makes complete sense. And honestly, I feel like I should now because saying it out loud makes me feel yeah. very ignorant. <laughs> No, I think there's some something to that. You know, I had a girlfriend. Here I am talking about all these fucking ex girlfriends. But, um, <laughs> I, did, um, I, did. I had this girlfriend who was bulimic, and it caused me to like want to cure her or fix her or something. And you know, I started reading all these books about it. I was so young, and one thing I learned was the uh, I don't know, I don't know if it was adrenaline or some sort of opioid or something that gets released in the brain that's like 10 times more potent than heroin uh, gets released in the brain when someone binges and purges. And I was like, dude, she can't stop. At this point, it's not as simple as, hey, just stop throwing up. It's no, at this point, her body, as soon as she eats, it's just like, we got to get rid of this because we need that, that dopamine or whatever it was. And re reading this at 17 years old, you know, I was like, oh, so she, now she's like a junkie in this way. And it just was like this um, insurmountable monster that two people alone couldn't couldn't defeat but I think there is a way to rehabilitate that right like I think about that I'm a I'm a caffeine fiend like even though I have drug-free tattooed on my knuckles <laughs> here caffeine is like my thing and 
And there are some times that like certain drinks don't affect me anymore. They just don't like I can drink um, a Red Bull and then go to sleep. Like it doesn't pump me up or whatever, but I think I have attacked that part of my brain quite a bit. Like I've abused it where I don't think it has the same effects. Um, so I'm definitely a product of that. But I also know that there's certain things I can do physiologically to tap into something that has been conditioned for me that can light me up. You know, um, Tony Robbins calls them incantations. Are you familiar with this? Uh, drop my memory. Well, it, it's something as so simple as everybody needs, you'd mentioned like some sort of tick or like a, I don't know, a trigger. But, but there are triggers that you can teach your brain. And so if you fire up that trigger, and if you, for instance, let's say you, you go for a run, you get your heart rate above like 140, 150. And if you start telling yourself something in that state, let's say you say, my name's John Ways, and I'm the motherfucking man. In that state when you're running, and so you have a 40 minute run, and all you're doing is telling yourself, I'm John Ways, I'm, a, I'm the motherfucking man. Well, pretty soon, you know, you could be in a different state where you feel a little sluggish or something, but all you got to do is, I'm John Ways, I'm the motherfucking man. And instantly those neurons in your brain are like, oh, fuck yeah, we know this feeling because when you run, you know, you can condition those and, and link those neurons together, right? So I think that's how maybe, I'm not a fucking neurologist, but I do think there are ways to recondition the brain because we condition our brains all the time. Yeah, we program ourselves all the time, you know, uh, consciously or unconsciously. And, and I was curious to see, you know, there's this Spider-Man thing with great power comes great responsibility. You obviously yield tremendous power. You know, this is a form. It's, it's a form of a mutant power, man. Like it, it is. Surely, you know that even if even if it is like a wee bit staged, like what you were saying with this video production, you know, you got a location scout and you got to prepare. Of course, and I understand logistically why you need to do that. So there is a performative aspect to it, but at the same time, you know, even if you're a good stand up comic and all you do is crack wise and make jokes, there's something about a person like that that has developed that mutant skill that can, it's like a camouflage in public. They can infiltrate different cultures and tribes and like assimilate with them because they know how to cut through that bullshit, right? So I think you've developed a, a real tremendous skill. What, 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 if, um, what, what does your circle, the five people around you have to say about that? Do they, I mean, surely they have to trust you fully. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Something the yeah. inner child in me <laughs> told me at the, at the top of this, at the top of this call was, isn't hypnosis just another word for manipulation? It can be. Um, Does manipulation have to have a bunch of negative sauce all over it? No, I, I think that, you know, think about it. You could be manipulated and um, do bet to do bad things. If you think about it, and I think this is the first time I might, might have ever thought about it this way, based on how you phrase that question, isn't hypnotherapy just manipulation for positivity? It, it it can be right because then there's also the priests who don't right and i've seen it and i and i've seen these priests i've just been in weird situations where for some reason i'm, I'm having lunch with these guys and and uh they've shown me iphone videos of like here i was in, in guatemala and there was this little eight-year-old girl who was possessed by the devil and they're showing me the video and they're like we snapped her out of it you know and they make it sound like there's a connection from god and there's a spiritual thing about that um, but I know that, that these are people that are, that are puppet masters and they're pulling the strings of, of, um, of people of, um, I read this quote that like, in order to solve a problem, you require a higher level of consciousness than it took that created that problem. Right. So it's really easy for someone with a high equilibrium to come in with someone that has a low frequency. And I don't want to I don't want to put salt on someone's IQ when I say low frequency, but you know I know what, what you mean, mean though. I'm talking about vibes here, but um, yeah, you know, when someone that has that high equilibrium and they come in, you know, all of a sudden, if they say, "Yeah, I'm a man of the cloth," and I was, I was anointed and kissed by God or whatever, there's a certain amount of people that 
that believe that, that want to believe that, right? So with great power comes great responsibility. And so I don't think it's all good or all bad, but it is real. I don't think that's disputable. I think there was a, years ago, I did an interview with a nun who was one of my religion teachers growing up for my company, Hypno Kick, where I teach, where I used to do weekly free hypnosis lessons. And we did an interview with her and we're like, all right, so a lot of people think what I do is the devil's work. And um, she's like, really? I'm like, yeah. And people think I'm possessed human, like demons from hell. And I, I put them in people's bodies and that's why people do what they do. And she goes, huh, you never did that in religion class. And I was like, oh, you just didn't see it, you know, joking around. But I even asked her from her uh, knowledge and experience as a nun. And the lesson came down to it is a tool. And like every other tool, it's the intentions of the user that dictate whether or not the tool will be used for good or for bad, like a gun, neither good nor evil. But if you shoot someone because you're angry, that's evil. But if you're shooting someone to protect your life or the life of those you love because they're invading your life for no good reason, that's technically uh, you know, a tool used for good. So it comes down to what is the intentions of the hypnotist? And I always tell people, research the hypnotist. Like, do they have videos? Do they have a promo? What are their reviews? Um, and look into what well, the news sources. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. And I, I was initially avoiding this just because it gave me such bad publicity last year, but it wasn't all my fault, but I couldn't say that publicly because people were still hating and not willing to understand and accept. But one thing I didn't mention earlier that was a huge impact on my life last August was I appeared on the news like two or three times on the East Coast because I did a show at um, JMU in Virginia and I hypnotized a stadium full of kids uh, at the university freshmen and several of them had panic and anxiety attacks. And one, one, one of the student organizers threw up on the floor and everyone's saying, Oh, he was way out of his leg. He was doing this. He's a terrible quality hypnotist. You know, he should be ashamed of himself. This and the other thing without realizing like there are safety precautions I took that I'm convinced some of the students didn't take seriously. Cause I said, if you have this, if you have that, blah, 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 blah do not volunteer. But then mm -hmm. on the other side of that coin, the university did something that you're not supposed to do, mm -hmm. which is they streamed it. And they filmed me doing everything. And then they projected what I was doing and saying. So and we know, or at least I know that most humans are very visual creatures. So when you see something happen in your mind, that can possibly affect you and make yeah. you start reacting the same way. And be, when certain people I was hypnotizing reacted negatively, people in the audience who might have been going under hypnosis because they were projecting the whole thing, which they shouldn't have been doing, started getting affected by the hypnosis. And then when they saw someone reacting negatively to that hypnosis procedure, they would react negatively. And then that created a domino effect. And the more people that they were streaming me trying to help out of those negative reactions, the more people got negative reactions. And then the university eventually just blamed everything on me and made it look like, you know, I'm the reason everything went wrong. And I didn't help any of the students and refused to report what I, everything I just mentioned to you on top of the fact that I literally helped every single student for an hour after the show to make sure that they were mentally and emotionally stable so they could all safely go back to their dorm rooms. And we even had one student hooked up to a heart rate monitor proving that me coming up to her and helping her with her breathing and relaxing and controlling her stress and anxiety from what happened, the heart rate monitor proved that not only was I lowering her heart rate, I was actually helping her anxiety, but obviously they're not going to report that. Mm -hmm. But that created a huge fiasco. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always joke, I'm like, yeah, but my Google rating was never better until after that show. Because <laughs> of the publicity. Yeah, people were like Googling my name and hypnosis and even my mom and my manager were both like, you know, all publicity is good publicity. And people, my mom was like, you know, now people are going to question, you know, a lot of people say, oh, hypnosis isn't real, it's BS. If that's true, why are people reacting like this? If it has no psychological effect, why are people having physiological responses to it? And considering how many Google searches I had for my name and my website, I find it hard to believe that people weren't at that point, thoroughly researching the science and psychology behind hypnosis. This is fascinating to me. You know, I, um, one of my favorite movies is a, is a film that came out in 2012 called The Master, and it stars Joaquin Phoenix. And there's a scene in there where he's actually in, 
this is funny. I didn't even think about this as I started mentioning this, but there's a scene where a cult leader, as a matter of fact, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, who was my favorite actor before he passed away. Um, he's a cult leader and he's kind of doing a form of hypnosis on this guy. And he's asking him a series of questions and he's getting his guard down and, and, in, and, he, and, and during this session, he's telling him, you can't blink. And if you blink, we're going to have to go back to the start and ask these questions again. So meanwhile, Joaquin Phoenix is there, and he's such a good actor, you know. And uh, he's crying. And I remember watching this movie on the biggest screen that there was in Texas. And I'm crying as I'm watching this scene, and I'm watching Joaquin Phoenix cry. And then as soon as it's over, the actor, the, the, the line in the movie is, close your eyes. And I closed my eyes. And I was under fucking hypnosis, you know. And... That's why I love movies so much is because it's the art of the possible. Like you're able to use dream language, unconscious language, really. And through pictures, transport people like humans are dumb. Let's be fucking honest. <laughs> like humans are so malleable. I don't want to say weak because humans are also really uh, Can I dexterous and, really quick? and strong. Absolutely. But I just, I just wanted to just to put a button on that and I'll, uh, I can, we, go to what you no, no, I want you to continue that. I just want to say that I always find it interesting when people say hypnosis is for the dumb people. Yeah. Based on the science and psychology of it. And I'm not meaning this in any mean way. I mean, scientifically speaking, if you are mentally retarded, it is far more challenging to hypnotize you. Oh, if you don't have mental challenges, because you have to be able to consciously understand what I'm saying and go along with the process and do what I say, as I say, yeah. for it to work versus I can see someone that. who's mentally challenged can't so people who are like oh you can only do that if you're weak-minded i'm like you're weak-minded for thinking that but no as you were saying yeah and so at the same time people are very dexterous and very tough and it takes tremendous will to to storm into a battlefield right so i i'm on both hands humans are are just so malleable and you know all it takes is a simulation and and humans will believe anything really is what I'm trying to say. I, I don't know if you can put Elon Musk, man, we're all in a simulation. That's something to think about. I, I think about that every time, you know, when they discovered the Higgs boson particle, the God particle, when they discovered it, I remember thinking like, well, what does this mean in the simulation? Like, did we discover some sort of key pixel? Like, what did we, what does this mean? I, 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 gee, I don't know. But um, it is fascinating to, to think about that kind of stuff. Absolutely. But, but yeah. movies are so trans, um, transportative is that a word like it takes you to another place where you forget that you're in your body that's a form of hypnosis i was just i was literally just about to say like people like i remember you saying earlier you were in that one show and trying to embarrass the girlfriend initially like that may have not worked but that movie experience that you just explained is a literal form of hypnosis you were influenced and you were kind of in the same mindset and connecting with that character and you were literally doing what they were doing because you're going through the exact same process. Yeah. Like that is hypnosis in and of itself. If someone ever watches a movie and they're experiencing things that the characters are experiencing, or if they ever feel like they're in the movie and they forget they're in the movie theater or their home, yep. like that is me. a literal form of hypnosis. Absolutely. You know, my favorite thing that just gives me a, a dad boner every time. <laughs> it just like, just, just some things that just like make me so happy. And it's when you're at the movie theater and after the dumbass trailers, you know, the movie's about to start and the lights go down. When that happens, I'm like, I don't even care what's going on. I'm all about this moment. And I, I'm gone, man. Like, I'm not there. I'm not thinking about my bills. It's like skydiving, you know? Um, oh my God. I skydived once and I kind of had a very similar reaction as you insofar as, oh, cool. Check that off the list. Did it. I'm, <laughs> I had friends that were like, that did it a hundred times. And I'm like, not me. But After um, watching David Blaine, I want to do it again. Do it again, Mazel Tov, man. Uh, I'm out <laughs> here in Texas. I know a great place, one of the best places to, to get your jumps in if you're serious. But um, um, shout out to Skydive Lone Star. But, but kind of like, you know, those 60 seconds of free fall, that's me at a movie, man. Like I'm free falling, nothing else exists. And, and I love that. And uh, I wish I could do that. You have to give yourself up to it just like you the way you do therapy man you know like surely there are certain things where you put someone's guard down you get them comfortable you get consent it's like turning the lights down at the movie theater and all of a sudden you're in and in that state well, then you perform then you then you do the thing um one question i want to ask you because i regret not asking you because it's not every day i speak to a professional hypnotist but and i'm not telling you to cure me but give me some tools that i can look <laughs> up get, just give me direct me to some sort of <clears throat> 
tools um, and I'll do the rest, but, and I got to wrap up here. I'm so sorry. Nice. Um, I have one problem when it comes to my life. I'm not addicted to cigarettes. I'm not a, you know, I don't have something like that, but good for you. One thing that, yeah, I got lucky because uh, I have addiction in my genes for sure. One thing that Gary V talks about, and every time I hear him talk about it, I'm like, preach brother, because that is the magic sauce. Um, I, for whatever reason, childhood stuff, I've figured it all out. I know what it is. I don't want to spill my guts here, but uh, never had a chance to develop self-esteem, self-love. And when I encounter people that are just tremendous, beautiful beings with, a, with such a bright light, I always want to be like, man, how do, how, how, do you, how do you feel good about yourself? Teach me. Like, I just want to feel good about myself. Like, I make movies and I make a living and it, everything's all fine and dandy, but I just want to feel good about myself. What you're talking about, happiness. Like, I don't give a shit about paychecks. You know, when your mom that one Christmas told you, I'm proud of you, son, you know, like, you stayed the course. I guarantee you that felt better, especially when you reflect on it now, than any paycheck that's ever deposited into your bank account. And for me, I've had that experience too, where I'm just like, I feel good and it doesn't really last long. And, but there, uh, there's a root, I don't want to call it self-hatred, but on bad days, I'll call it self-hatred. And what are some tools that I can, that I can do or somebody like me or listeners that are listening to this podcast, what can they do to turn the switch? There's got to be some sort of switch. And, and, what is that? Like, if you had to hypnotize yourself, like, I just want to feel good about myself. I want to appreciate this, this mind, body and spirit that I have the privilege to have. Like, I want to be grateful. I want to feel good. How, how does somebody do that? I think it's different for everyone. Um, I think it's interesting that people, the, the most overused joke for me is probably when I don't, there are plenty of days where I'm just like, man, I look fugly <laughs> or, you know, I'm, I'm just not feeling it today. And people are like, why don't you just hypnotize yourself to feel it? I'm just like, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm human. You know, it's still, you, you can't have good without bad. You can't have highs without lows. Um, there was a, was this it's September now? There was a week last month where I literally, I have no clue what happened. But at, at first I was like, do I have COVID? And then I was like, do I have depression? I didn't know what it was, but I was literally Monday through Thursday, I think. I was in bed every day. I didn't do anything. I wasn't, I didn't make any progress. I didn't do any work. I didn't even go to martial arts. And I love going martial arts because it helps get the endorphins flow and helps get the energy going. It helps me feel productive and like I'm doing something in my life. I didn't do anything. And I didn't understand why. And I told my mom, I was like, I'm going to go in for COVID testing because I don't know if I have fatigue and that's one of the COVID symptoms. And I ended up testing positive. And I was like, I don't know if I have depression or whatever. Um, and then I just realized that I think it was, I think it was partially depression and it was just because I haven't been able to go out and do what I love. And I, and I realized for me, at least it's like, they say, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And in the words of Philip DeFranco, that's bullshit. It's bullshit. You're doing work. And at some point it's going to get to you, even if it's not, you know, your every average every day, nine to five job. You don't need to work that many hours a day or a week to feel like bogged down for because everyone gets down for some reason or another. I think sometimes we all need to just unplug and do something that makes us happy. And even like for me, I'm I'm addicted to work. Like I work every single day in some way, shape, or form. Um, but that week was the first time in a long time I did like nothing for an entire week. And what helped me was disconnecting from my addiction which was work and seeing i saw my mom more times in that week than i think i've seen her in months and talking with friends and just hanging out and not really worrying about work and just doing whatever it is i could mm -hmm. to have fun and be kind of like a kid again if you will um but when it comes to loving yourself i think it's a very it's a very broad question and it's hard for me to, I'm not sure it's possible even for one person, let alone me of all people on this earth to pinpoint an answer for that. But I know that what works for me is that when I have finally recharged and recalibrated myself, that when I can focus on doing something, 
as a passion fun project versus a, I have to do this because I have a work schedule. I'm much happier. The moment I give myself a schedule or due date, or, you know, I have all this stuff to do, I have to do it because this is work. I find that I'm emotionally immediately distraught and I feel drained. And it did feel good when my mom said she was proud of me. But right when you said that, the first thing that came to mind was that was not the cake itself. That was the cherry on top. Because mm -hmm. even if she didn't say it to this very day, I'm still happy with where I am. Like, I have the house I have. I bought the car I have now in cash with money I made from a tour. I made the life I had. And people only conform to this life because of the fact that, and this is what I tell everyone trying to go for a dream. Well, what if this person or that does, person doesn't approve or believe in me and support me? No one's ever going to fully support or believe in you because they don't see your vision and no one's going to fully support or see that vision until you physically manifest it into their reality by being persistent and chasing it yourself because that's what you want to do. And I don't know if this even answers the question, but this is just what I have found for myself recently is if it makes you happy and you're actually making something of yourself and you're able to support yourself with it, then just do it. But obviously that right when I say just do it, I immediately feel like, you know, I can categorize myself in the cliche, oh, privileged position because I have already made it in that position. Do you so, have two legs? Hmm? You have two legs. What does that mean? Yeah, you have two legs. You're fucking bipedal. You're privileged. You can walk and Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, some people don't even have that, right? Well, which is funny because there's actually a uh wheelchair hypnotist in the UK. Got him. Named Jonathan Chase. So there's no excuse. No excuses. <laughs> No, that's well put, man. You did answer the question. We need to hear that. We need to remind ourselves that. That's something that I forget. I forget to tap into that inner five-year-old and make him happy. I'm the last person that I make a priority happy sometimes. And sometimes as a dad, you know, we put ourselves last, but really, you know, that's like they tell us on the airplane, we got to put the mask on ourselves first, right? So we forget that sometimes. You got to take care of yourself first. Sorry. No, please. Uh, I just, uh, say what you're going to say. And then I want you to tell people where they can find you on the internet and how they can support the cause and the next projects that you have, you know, if you can send me some links so people can see it in the show notes, I want to make sure they get them. Yeah. For me personally, I just realized recently that, um, it's because I am addicted to work. Like I'll literally wake up and, and check my stats or check things I could do to make money that day, whether it's a client or, you know, another, cause I have like three jobs. Um, that I have to start taking care of my health more because the more I work, the less I eat, the less I take care of my health, um, you know, dietary wise and physical wise with my home gym and my martial arts. And the more I put my diet and health first, the better I feel throughout the day and the better I do in work or martial arts or whatnot. So I think everyone needs to kind of tune into themselves and figure out what is it you're missing. If your life feels dull, are you entertaining the five-year-old? Do you feel like shit throughout the day? Are you taking care of your diet and exercise? listen to your body because deep down we all know i think we we kind of naturally innately know through the sixth sense or whatever you want to call it what needs to be attended to and you need to attend to that otherwise you're going to continue and whatever that thing is you're feeling is going to get worse and i just went grocery shopping the other day for the first time in like two or three weeks and i feel way better now that i have food and you know my house again and i'm eating um, a pescatarian diet and i'm eating very healthy i'm eating limited junk and fried shit and last night was the first time in weeks where I went to use my home gym and did uh, some martial arts stuff. And I felt really good. And I mean, right now, a rain energy drink is my <laughs> breakfast because I've, I've had a really hard time getting up before noon recently because of my addiction to work. Um, so thank you, one, for having me on and forcing me to get up early and drink this and get hopefully on a better sleep schedule later this week. Um, and as far as connecting, uh, so we just premiered a uh, hypno spoof on YouTube, which is uh, youtube.com forward slash John Ways, J O N W A Y E S. Uh, Twitter, I rarely use, but sometimes ran or put motivational quotes because I need them and they're really just a projection of what I'm telling myself or my younger self. Um, but I'm most on most of the time YouTube, like every single day. And that's where I'm going to start uploading a bunch of content, whether it's, you know, free hypnosis for entertainment, free hypnotherapy to help people, or just entertaining monthly episodes. And obviously, if you want to, you know, an illusionist, a magician, a mentalist, or a hypnotist for an upcoming event, um, feel free to use my YouTube to look at my promos or 
uh, go to my site, johnways.com, and you can contact my manager there. We entertain nationally, and we're looking to eventually in the next year or two go international. Uh, a lot of requests from Canada, but no one wants to pay the airfare. <laughs> um, bastards. Cheap I, bastards. I would like to go to the land of A and maple syrup. Um, but yeah, I think YouTube, Instagram, you can. Uh, a lot of oh, there, I'm going to go on a quick rant here, and I and another rant on top of that is, um, <laughs> <laughs> again, ADHD. Love it. Um, I, I recently did a podcast where someone was like, you know, how can people contact you? Or, you know, what's your pet peeve? I'm like, and I recently realized that what grinds my gears is people who DM me on Instagram. It's like, hey, can I ask you a question? And immediately I'm thinking, that is your question. Yeah. You already fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> Just yeah. ask the question. Yeah. Um, but you can't, you, you can DM me, but be aware of uh, two things. One, I personally try to only get on Instagram once a month. So I don't waste my time scrolling through feed because I used to waste hours and days um, on Instagram. And two, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to have my manager take care of most of my social media because I'd rather be productive than worry about what social media is going on. But I want to respond to people without having to do it myself so I can do my own thing. Um, but yeah, Instagram, Hypnotista, H-Y-P-N-O-T-I-S-T-A. You can get me there. Um, I don't really respond to Facebook. I'm definitely going to have my manager start taking care of that because I don't like Facebook anymore. Um, but yeah, I think YouTube is probably going to be the way to go. And that's where you're going to see me most consistently. And like I said, my website, if you want to talk about um, anything business-wise. And dude, thank you, had, by the way, uh, Mr. Had, Mr. Monroe. Yeah, this was Knives. Fun. Thank you. Call me Knives, dude. This was so knives. fun. I want to do this again, man. So please remember me because <laughs> this podcast is going to be, you're going to inspire the next generation um, of hypnotists, magicians, people oh, that can are I, going. Can I give a piece that. of walk away uh, applicable advice to people? Because that's what I that's what I'm trying to do on my podcast now. Only too. on the condition if you're a pescatarian that you get a, a blood uh, metals check. I don't even know what because that is. <laughs> so 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 fish because you said that fish has like mercury and because we fucked up the oceans right. So like mm. I'm all about eat all the fish you want. Like it's great. My favorite thing is ahi tuna. Right. I'm a hipster like that. I am from Austin after all. <laughs> But at the same time, they have a lot of what they call metals, like mercury and things like that. They get into the water that the fish eat. So get a blood metals check, right? You know, uh, go to the doctor and just they check out your blood and they'll tell you, dude, your pH levels all fucked up just because <laughs> I, I know that a lot of people get it on that diet. So it may have been the thing that that's it's like a silent killer, I believe. I'm kind of ironically, like, oh. I eat very little fish. Oh, do you? Okay. Good, I, good, I eat good. shrimp and a little bit of like salmon here and there, but I, I just eat a lot of, um, my, my favorite thing to do on the diet is honestly just a lot of fruits and veggies. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, give me that runaway advice, please. Um, for anyone who, and I think this is my favorite thing to say on all podcasts, just because I know in this generation, especially any younger audiences listening are always asking me, you know, oh, well, you know, you're privileged or, you know, you got what you want out of life and you're doing what you want to do, but I can't because of whatever. First of all, as I said before, your parents, your family, your friends, your brother, sister, aunt, uncle, significant other, no one's going to see your vision fully and clearly as you do until you manifest into their physical reality. And one of the best ways to start doing that, I got very fortunate. Jane Noble's out reached out to me and invited me to Vegas. But if you research some of the top, like the five top people in your field, uh, let alone locally, Mm -hmm. that are doing what you want to do and doing it professionally, kind of like I did with knives, reach out to all of them and propose to all of them like, hey, can I be your assistant? Can I be your secretary? Can I be your whatever? Can I job shadow on you? Could I do a mentorship with you? Reach out to all of them and give them, ask them all the exact same thing because eventually, statistically, someone is likely to say yes. But you need to find someone who can train or mentor you to get you to where you want to be because if they're already successful in where you want to be, they're going to help fast track you to exactly the point that you want to be at faster than anyone else in your immediate circle, most likely. Because if you think about it, you are where you are because of the people in your circle. If you were where you want to be, you wouldn't need to be listening to this or taking this advice to begin with. But look for someone who's already at where you want to be, figure out how you can train with them and just do that and do whatever they tell you. Because at this point, me and my other company hypno kick i have the ability now to take people from where i was at 19 to where i am now within one to two months of our new mentorship program and i can get them their first like thousand dollar client quicker than i ever did but um, you gotta you're, find compre those you're compressing a decade into two months that's insane that's tremendous man that's what i'm trying to get people to realize and people are like well five thousand dollars for a mentorship is really quick or a, a lot of money i go yeah 
not when you're charging one to two thousand dollars a client and the knowledge i give you in that two month period you're literally using for the rest of your life hell yeah yeah people don't want to think about the rest of their life like if you're going to be around for another 80 years five thousand dollars is nothing so when i was 19 i was like twelve hundred dollars an hour i'm like that literally in one show i was paying off my entire mentorship hell yeah so i was that's like what, do it that's what i like man john this was, this was this was awesome man uh, I want to do a, a follow up one day. Um, 100%. What, once do the it. world gets back to normal and you start going on tours, we can start talking about the dates, what you got going on. Um, but this is incredible, man. I was talking to my wife before this and I was like, on my calendar, I'm speaking to a hypnotist. Like, <laughs> I was like, I haven't even prepared for this. And it's <laughs> two minutes in and I was like, wait a second. I'm deeply curious about this. I have tons of questions. Like, you know, this is insane. So, this is tremendous, man. You, you turn someone who's not even into this world into, into someone who's not only a believer, but a supporter, man. So I really appreciate that. And I'm glad you came on and hopefully we can do another one soon. All your information is going to be in, in the links below. So check out John Ways and check out his YouTube channel because great shit is coming. Support the cause. Uh, John, I appreciate you, man. We did it. Dude, thank you. I was literally pumped for this all week and waiting for it. And uh, I literally have like, I love your interview and I love your energy and style. So like literally just hit me up. I will literally do this any other time. Like, we'll yeah. do it. Oh, it's going to happen. All right. I appreciate you, man. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Never ever believe anything you hear. I believe only half of what you see. And always, 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 forever, never, never put a force field around your heart.